Marloes is a chair in the section Biomedical Photonics and Medical Imaging at VU Amsterdam. And she is an expert in developing state-of-the-art technology for biologically relevant problems, which has arranged uh, it's quite wide, wide range from her fundamental research on structural dynamics in proteins to her translational research on nonlinear label-free microscopy. And that is also what she will talk about today. She has co-founded the startup company Femto Diagnostics and collaborates with a wide range of clinicians to translate the higher harmonic imaging technique into the clinic to enable instant pathology. Um, a part of the talk today will also be given by a researcher from her group, Max Blocker, who's working on convolutional neural networks for automatic analysis of these images. Marloes, we are very excited to see the possibilities of this new technique. The floor is yours. Marloes, you are muted. Yes, okay. I found the unmute button. Uh, so thanks, uh, Marlene and Ping um, uh, Kun uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's so a, a pleasure to be here and uh, uh, to share our latest results with you. So indeed, this is about uh, a relatively novel technique, higher harmonic generation microscopy that we develop uh, to enable instant pathology in uh, the, uh, the operating room in the clinic. And uh, first, a few words about uh, what, what, what is this technique. So it's a, a nonlinear technique. So we focus a laser beam uh, into uh, the tissue, and then the tissue itself generates the second or third harmonic, which means that uh, uh, what, two or three photons from the incoming laser beam are uh, converted into one photon with two times the energy or three times the energy for the third harmonic generation signal. And um, probably you're more used to uh, fluorescence microscopy, but this is a label-free technique which provides us with subcellular resolution. And uh, so we can uh, obtain our images quite fast. So it is a real-time 3D imaging technique. And the, uh, yeah, the innovations which have been realized in the startup company, uh, Femto Diagnostics here, um, uh, have resulted in a, a, a mo mobile setup, uh, which uh, uses only a very low power on the laser, uh, low laser power on the sample. And um, the contrast sources, so why uh, this, uh, how we generate these images, is that the third harmonic uh, generation uh, signal generation depends on interfaces, optical interfaces in the sample. So every time there's a transition from uh, uh, one area to the other, so here this is from the neuropil and the cytoplasm, uh, we have a uh, intense signal and we choose to color this green. Of course, this is just um, arbitrary. And you see that we can visualize uh, the cell, I, maybe it's better to have a better pointer here, laser pointer. So we can visualize here the, uh, the neuropil, like I said, but also the uh, nucleus of the cell and even some nucleoli inside. And these are the contours of fat cells. Now the, um, the second harmonic signal is sensitive to non-centrosomatic structures and uh, Collagen is an example of that, and which is really fortuitous because uh, the body contains a lot of collagen. So we can visualize all that uh, in the connective tissue, but also in the uh, uh, vessel walls of, of blood vessels. And uh, by just adding a third detector, we also are able to pick up uh, fluorescence from intrinsic chromophores in the tissue, like, for example, elastin and uh, other components uh, in uh, granulus in the cell. Um, so earlier, um, uh, we uh, demonstrated that with this technique, uh, so uh, we can get a very nice um, cytological image of brain tumors. And you see here in green and red uh, are the, the, the nonlinear images. And here we compare these images with the uh, histology by the pathologist. So, uh, so here, cell nucleus, 
And um, uh, for pathologists, the ratio between a cell nucleus and the cytoplasm is of uh, uh, importance. We can visualize that. Here you see tumor cells, and they have, uh, you can see the shape. It's elliptical in shape, so it means it's a high grade tumor. And so this we published earlier already, uh, four years ago. And also at the time we had some automated image analysis uh, algorithms uh, uh, developed, which allowed us to, to uh, uh, do a, uh, automated image analysis, in, in, which res resulted in, an, in, in very good agreement with the diagnosis uh, made by pathologists. And later in this talk, we will, um, um, so Max will discuss with, uh, his latest results using uh, convoluted neural networks, because this uh, uh, method was very accurate, but it is very slow. And as our images collection is, is very fast, we need also a fast um, image analysis program. But today I, I want to show you some of our latest results, which are, it's a project that is still ongoing in the clinic. Um, on our uh, lung diseases. So um, we, uh, I'm going to see what I can get this out of view, but yes. Um, so we uh, are now in the clinic and um, uh, we look at lung cancer and at interstitial lung diseases. And if I have sufficient time, I'll also show some result on COVID-19. And uh, so the problem here in the clinic is that uh, we need instant on-site pathological feedback uh, to speed up the cancer diagnostic, uh, to increase the sample quality of biopsies, because now multiple biopsies are taken to make sure that, that there's enough information in them. But if we can immediately inspect those biopsies and tell this, the, uh, the clinician, well, there's enough information in this biopsy to, uh, to, uh, to make a diagnosis, then uh, we can perhaps limit these taking the number of biopsies. And with every biopsy, there's also a risk of bleeding and so on. And also in the, also in the operating room, uh, now surgeons have to wait for a quick analysis, for, uh, for example, on the frozen section, uh, which takes 30 minutes. And so if we can uh, accelerate this process, then also uh, the operating uh, room can be shorter. And we do this really by having this uh, mobile setup. And I will demonstrate here with a short movie. This is uh, PhD student, uh, Laura van Huysen. Um, she has here a piece of unprepared tissue, um, which she puts into the microscope. And then when she closes uh, the lid, so now she places it just a wide field camera to see the sample. She closes the lid and the uh, laser uh, is turned on. And you see that in the right image, there's immediately, uh, there's a signal there. So there's no need to, to look for uh, the focus or the sample or so on. And now with her joystick, uh, she uh, navigates over this tissue sample and uh, yeah, can visualize all these structures. And while she's navigating, all these images are stored, so uh, they can also be uh, analyzed later. But you see the technique, uh, collection of, of one image takes only uh, a second or so. Now, uh, we have brought this uh, machine into the uh, endoscopy room and into the uh, surgery suite. So this is uh, this is Laura again. This is Jauke Anema, one of the pulmonologists we uh, collaborate with. And the procedure is that the uh, so the clinician takes the biopsy, uh, we do the imaging, and then the biopsy goes uh, to the uh, pathology department where they do the standard workup, so the standard histology, so we can uh, uh, compare our images to the uh, golden standard. And uh, well, this is just to show how beautiful our images are. Uh, this is part of an artery where you see the flexible uh, wall of this uh, of this uh, artery here in blue. The elastin is specialized here. Uh, cells in in, uh, in in there, and here so in red you see the uh, collagen, uh, the connective tissue. 
Um, so first now uh, for lung cancer. Um, so the standard now is the uh, pathology, um, but the feedback which results from that is yeah takes uh, on average five working days, and we try to make this faster. And of course, to do that, we need to show that we are uh, as precise uh, and, and yield as much information as the standard histology. So this is a sample of, uh, of healthy uh, example of healthy tissue. So you see here an uh, alveoli, alveolar structure uh, consisting of uh, uh, elastin, that's the blue signal, and collagen, that's the red signal. And inside here, there's some mucus, so some air bubbles. And uh, we can make 3D scans. That's what you see here. Here you see a scan into the depth. And here you see a, a 3D visualization of that. And um, well, these structures that we visualize are where we compare quite well to the uh, histology images, which you also see here, the alveolar structure and um, uh, for both of these structures. Now, when we uh, look at the tumor sample, the, 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 yeah, the appearance is much different. So now we have a lot of green signal. So that's the third harmonic signal. So this whole uh, alveolar structure has almost completely disappeared and the volume is now filled with uh, cells, which give this um, uh, green third harmonic signal. And so you can uh, look at that, but you can also zoom in and then uh, inspect the uh, shape uh, of, the, of the cell nuclei, et cetera. And also look at the uh, growth pattern uh, of the different cells, and this allows you then to really uh, diagnose the type of, uh, of uh, tumor that we have here. So this is, I think, an adenocarcinoma, and this is something else of which I forgot the name. Um, so our technique visual, uh, enables to visualize uh, the pathological hall hallmarks, so what also this, the pathologist now uses in their images, their stained images, to uh, decide is this uh, what the diagnosis of the, of, of the is, and that is disruption of the extracellular matrix, eh? so this alveolar structure, the cell density, and uh, so there are a lot of cells in these in these images, and the morphology of these cells. Um, now we also wanted to see really if we now take these biopsies, what can we learn from them? So this is now an, an, a full, an image of a full biopsy. So you see uh, the whole, whole structure here. So this is a, a structure of um, uh, two and a half by two and a half millimeters. And in, in a few minutes, we have this uh, image in high resolution. So you can zoom in from this image, you can zoom into this structure and then uh, see uh, this, uh, all, these, all the cells. And this is another example of a biopsy uh, where there are hardly uh, cells present and, and it's, it's completely full here with uh, a lot of elastin. And this is then would then probably count as a not representative biopsy with which the, uh, for which it, it is, would be difficult for the pathologist to make a diagnosis because they want to see the cells and the cell morphology. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of the diseases uh, that we uh, look at are also characterized by uh, aberrant uh, organization of the tissue. And here you see um, a, a biopsy with a lot of um, fibrosis and uh, elastosis. So fibrosis by this structure here and the elastosis here, you see in these nice blue colors. Um, now, because we can see fairly good detail of the uh, individual cells or the shape of the cells and the uh, nuclei uh, of the cells, we can also distinguish um, uh, different types of cells. So here from the squamous epithelium and here from the respiratory epithelium. And uh, indeed also the different types of uh, tumors here, a carcinoid tumor, and here adenocarcinoma, which uh, yeah, the pathologist is, is, uh, can just look at our images and then make a diagnosis based on that. And they don't need the uh, H&E histology for that. 
Um, it's also often interesting, of course, to look at uh, immune cells. Uh, we, we not only see healthy pneumocytes and tumor cells, but also in, in this is an example in which we see macrophages. So they also show up. And therefore, uh, for the lung cancer case, uh, the conclusion is that we can indeed provide high resolution images within a minute or a few minutes. And uh, the potential clinical implications or applications are that we uh, in can increase the sample quality of biopsies, but also reduce the number of biopsies that are necessary to take and to uh, speed up uh, the diagnost diagnostic cancer workup. So uh, another uh, application is here, uh, a case study here. So we have here a, a CT uh, and a PET scan and uh, the endoscopist, uh, so they need to uh, have a diagnosis of this structure here. Um, so they take uh, with the uh, uh, endoscopy uh, a, a, a little piece of that apparent structure. And then uh, a minute later, uh, they can, um, uh, we can image that for them and therefore help and assist in the diagnosis of this, uh, of this patient. So the feedback here was received within four minutes. And the diagnosis uh, that resulted from this was an uh, epithelioid mesothelioma. And we can, uh, this was a uh, close up, so you can uh, image the whole uh, uh, biopsy and then uh, demonstrate what is the quality of this biopsy. Now, another important uh, application uh, for a, a class of diseases for which uh, they take uh, biopsies are the interstitial lung diseases. Um, so we are part now of a cold, what they call a cold study in which the different imaging techniques are compared. And um, um, yeah, so to to improve these these problems here, where you have uh, sampling errors and uh, only late uh, endoscopy feedback, uh, so we step in and hope to provide indeed instant feedback and uh, um, on the diagnosis, but also on the quality of the uh, taken biopsy. <coughs> now here you see. Um, uh, the alveolar structures again. You see that there is here a, a lot of elastin, and um, the septa here are thickened. Of course, I cannot diagnose it, but that is what the pathologist tell us, tells us. <coughs> and this is an, uh, another case, another patient. And you see that the uh, the aspect is the, the image looks quite different. And uh, that's because he and it looks like a lot more green. And uh, if you uh, look carefully, you see that there are a lot more cellular structures. So now there's a lot more third harmonic signal again, which um, uh, is confirmed by the uh, H&E analysis, in which you also see a lot of cellular structures. And uh, well, the first case was with thickened septa, but here you have a case in which there are a lot of very thin structures in these the other structures, um, which again uh, is confirmed by the H&E uh, pathology. So uh, in each of these cases, we have uh, uh, yeah very uh, images which are very rich in information, and uh, uh, we can visualize all the different hallmarks that the pathologist looks for, but then uh, at a much higher speed. Um, I also want to spend uh, a little bit of uh, time showing you uh, some, yeah, maybe not with the highest clinical relevance, but it is in these COVID times interesting, a, ca a, a case in which we were allowed to uh, also uh, inspect uh, COVID tissue from a deceased patient. And uh, so you see here uh, part of the lung. And in this image, uh, I would all, yeah, you see that they're very different from uh, the other images. And uh, for us, the first time we looked at it, uh, it looks almost like a tumor case because you see a lot of green signal, uh, which is indicative of the presence of uh, cells. So uh, 
probably this is uh, are all these immune cells which are called to this uh, to the rescue for this in infection, but indeed also produce this cytokine uh, storm. And in the uh, histology, uh, they uh, note uh, that there's increased uh, collagen, that the alveolar septi are thickened, uh, which makes breathing so much more difficult. But there are also regions with normal uh, septi. And this is all uh, this information we can also find back in our images. So here there's a lot of red, there's a lot of second harmonic signals showing the structure of the collagen. We see here a thickened uh, uh, alveolar structures, uh, both from the collagen and the elastin fibers, and also more normal uh, septi uh, structures. So uh, I hope that uh, with this uh, yeah, really clinical part, uh, I'm very happy that we are now in the clinic and that we're able to do this. And uh, uh, it looks quite successful, so we can indeed provide high resolution images of biopsies and help in the uh, assist in the diagnosis. And uh, it, we think that this will have really clinical implications because it will speed up the diagnostic work and it can potentially also reduce the number of uh, biopsies taken. And in the future, so, uh, or actually next is uh, that we uh, want to uh, quantify also these images and develop automatic image analysis procedures, but then also using these convoluted neural networks. And so Max uh, will in a minute take over and uh, tell you our progress in that direction. And uh, another project that we're now developing in the, in the lab or we're working on in the lab is to do all this on the tip of a needle so that we can insert this into the patient and do a in situ uh, uh, diagnosis of the uh, suspected lesions. Um, no, this, yeah, okay. So this is now uh, the clue for, for Max to take over. So because we have started on, uh, or we had collected already a lot of images on brain tumor tissue, uh, he uh, has started with developing his algorithms for uh, for those kind of tissues, and um, I'm now happy to um, stop sharing and then uh, give the floor to uh, to Max. Yes, thank you. All right. I hope this is all visible for everyone. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks, Marloes. And of course, thank you to the organizers for also allowing me to uh, discuss a little bit about what I'm working on. Um, ah, let me see. All right. So there is the mouse pointer as well. There we go. Uh, yeah, so I'm tasked with implementing artificial intelligence in our department, actually, for the first time that we're working on something like this. And uh, the question we asked ourselves was, can we support neurosurgeons in deciding how much tumor tissue to remove without having to wait for time intensive measures like HME staining on the already resected tissue? And I will show you that even with quite a heterogeneous data set that we have, we were able to train a good AI classifier to get a step closer towards our goal. So our goal is so imagine the neurosurgeon resecting the tissue and we are located next to him or maybe in the room next to him uh, um, and without any processing or slicing we image the tissue we get uh, with higher harmonic generation microscopy and all the images are produced in real time which also should uh, ask for in real time image analysis and this is what we can do with ai algorithms um, and in practice this would look like the uh, augmented reality microscope as shown here from Google AI, which works on regular H and E sections. So in our case, we would not have a microscope we would look through, but instead, because we have an inverted setup, we would look just at the screen and the, see the images, but also hopefully the outcome of the, of the uh, AI algorithms. And we actually turn, we turn to deep learning to achieve this goal because of the, the milestones in the image processing field, of course, like self-driving cars. Um, 
And deep learning is actually a subfield of machine learning, which is based on extracting features and learning patterns from data to perform tasks like classification or segmentation or super resolution. Uh, you might have heard of machine learning. Um, and in that case, the algorithm actually rely on humans providing them the features, and then the features first have to be extracted manually from the data. And deep learning actually allows us to automatically also extract these features based on your input, in this case, the handwritten digit database and uh, the desired outputs, which should be the actual number that the digit represents. And this is all thanks to algorithms called convolutional neural networks, which consist of several layers stacked, uh, which um, execute the convolution operation. So these layers are chock full with weights, as shown here in pink, and also here in yellow. So this is um, they slide across the input image, and convolution is applied between the pixels and the weights. So in this case, in green, we can see our image. And then in the down right corner are the weights of the kernel, and it slides across the image. And then a feature uh, is uh, what's the result of this convolution operation. And there can be loads and loads of these uh, kernels in a, in a single network. That is why we call it actually deep learning, because we can stack all these um, layers and weights and go as deep as we want. And the idea here is that the feature should sort of activate, meaning high values coming from the convolution operation, which means that a certain pattern is recognized. And the summation of all these features and all these layers, uh, it yields a certain prediction probability or a probability that the, uh, the image belongs to one of the categories that we are interested in. And this can be correct, but also wrong, of course. And uh, the network is continuously updated to, uh, through backpropagation to make sure that the weights will perform better uh, the next time that that input image is uh, feed forward to the network. So to train a convolutional network, you need at least two data sets a training set and a testing set. So the first one is, of course, used for training the network, and the second one should never be seen by the network until you are satisfied with the training part and you want to evaluate your network. Um, for our data set, we have included epilepsy patients as a reference class for healthy tissue. Um, the data set is quite small. It's also imbalanced because of the fact we have less epilepsy patients than uh, glioma cases. Um, in our case, the images from the training set, they inherit their label from the uh, post-operative diagnosis, um, which is either glioma or healthy. Our testing set is also small, but it's very strongly labeled, considering that each image is actually uh, labeled by three pathologists individually. So before we were actually ready to put this data to work with our convolutional neural networks, we uh, had to remove some noisy data from the data set. So uh, I included all of the available data from all the patients we had, and I did not exclude any data beforehand, but still a lot of, uh, and then of course, a lot of noisy uh, data sneaked its way in. And so what we did was um, we looked at various statistical uh, metrics computed on the frequency power spectrum of each image. So the frequency domain can indicate noise um, when, you, when you have, for example, a lot of fluctuations, a lot of power fluctuations in your higher image frequencies. Um, so a couple of images are extracted from the training set. And um, in our case, actually, kurtosis turned out to be a good the, a noise descriptor for our data. Uh, and kurtosis is a measure of tiltness of a probability distribution, and um, uh, it's corresponding to the extremity of the outlier. So it makes sense also. And um, as you can see here, I have three um, uh, set stacks. And um, um, for two cases, you can see the degrading image quality along the depth. From left to right, we go deeper inside uh, the tissue. And then you also see in yellow the kurtosis value going up for these two. And then for this case, uh, actually, the image quality doesn't degrade as much. There is no abundance of noise, so the kurtosis stays quite the same. And by applying this, by applying a kurtosis threshold calculated on the top 20% of the image frequencies, we were, we were excluding 4% uh, of our original training data set based on noise. 
So now we can go ahead with our cleanup data set. We can move on to training the algorithm. And we do this 10 times to make sure that we don't get very good or very bad results uh, as a fluke. So we do some basic image pre-processing to standardize the image input. And um, each time we create or train a new model, we take a random validation subset from our training set. So we take one epilepsy patient and four glioma patients as random. And this is sort of like a mini testing set. So during training, you are of course interested in the performance of your network. Uh, you don't really know um, if it's either um, memorizing the training set or actually learning the patterns. And that's where your validation set comes in. We balance both the validation and training sets with data augmentation because of the fact we have less epilepsy uh, samples than glioma. And then we train each individual model until it's converged, until the validation performance gets no longer any better. So this takes about 12 hours on a uh, four GPU machine that we use. And uh, the convolutional neural network that we use is actually quite a standard one uh, for your basic uh, classification tasks. So on to evaluating the model. So for each model, we generate a receiver operating characteristic curve. We calculate the area under this curve. So we can do this for the 10 models um, based on their performance on the validation set. So we get a performance of 0 0.9. Uh, or the area on the curve of 0 0.9 on the validation set with quality control. So we can compare this by training 10 models on the entire uh, training set without any quality control, and we get an area on the curve on average of uh, 0 0.7. So this, this is quite interesting because of only excluding 4% of the data, we get a huge jump in, a, in, a, in performance just on the validation set. So then we move on by going further with these 10 models trained on the, to the, on the quality control data set, and we move on to the testing set. And for this set, we get a uh, average area on the curve of 0 0.777. And this is actually a very nice result considering the data set limitations our models had to deal with in the first place. Um, here on the right side, you can see an average ROC curve uh, for the test set. So in blue, you can see the, the mean ROC and then in gray, the standard deviation and mean area of 0 0.77. So um, all the models, they output a single value for each image. And this value is between 0 and 1. And then binary classification is done by applying a threshold at 0 0.5, straight in the middle. So any scores lower than that is considered healthy and any scores higher than 0 0.5 is considered glioma. And this threshold doesn't always have to be the most opto optimal one, depending on your data set. So uh, actually from the ROC curve, you can extract um, a threshold, a better threshold yourself. So what we did was we take the best performing model from the 10 models that we trained. We plot the ROC curve, as you can see here, and we can take the threshold for which there is a very high number of true positives and very low number of false positives, which is here in the top left corner. Then we can use this threshold and uh, apply it on our test set images. So we, um, we take this top model, we uh, make it predict a value on each test set image and we apply our threshold. And what we then get is a binary accuracy of 83% versus the, uh, of course, the consensus of the pathologist, because they also looked at the test sets, three pathologists. And um, compared to the earlier work that Marloes also talked about, the earlier work had a 93% accuracy, but was uh, much slower. And we can um, uh, make these predictions in a couple of milliseconds for a 2D image. So uh, now we would, of course, like to move on to publishing this and, uh, of course, also, in addition, include more data with the portable setup uh, in the clinic when COVID allows us. Um, and we are also increasingly focusing on endoscopic application, as Malou said, and, of course, when we get the possibility, we want to gather more data from that, uh, make sure our algorithms can also work on that kind of data. And finally, uh, move on and apply AI on other fields of interest, like, for example, lung cancer. So these, uh, this is my part of the talk. Um, if you have any questions, you can direct them either at uh, Malus or me.
Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Malus and Max, for your uh, wonderful talk. Now we can actually open the floor to um, the audience for um, questions. Yeah, as I said before, you can um, um, post your question in the Q&A section or just uh, raise your hand. I'll enable you to talk so you can ask your question. Well, maybe I can uh, start first. Um, yeah, Malos, actually, that's a very uh, impressive work um, by um, moving this uh, um, histology uh, pathology part from the jet lab into the uh, OR room. A um, few years ago, I was in the uh, uh, OR room uh, once for the uh, uh, lung uh, biopsy using endoscopy. Um, they actually were talking about this such kind of technology. If you can do this just by set, right? You can take out the sample to do the imaging. You have done that exactly. Yeah, that's wonderful. And also very impressive uh, image quality and um, amazing uh, uh, pictures. So you also briefly mentioned that you're working on that to um, uh, integrate into the tip of the uh, uh, endoscopy, right? To make a kind of uh, in situ uh, imaging. Uh, we were also talking about, yeah, by the way, I worked for uh, Philips Research a few years ago. So we were also talking about uh, uh, such kind of technology. We call it uh, a photonic needle, right? So mm -hmm. there are some kind of efforts on that. Uh, then um, what do you see actually are the challenges there right, compared to um, taking out the tissue outside the uh, the body for the uh, on-site uh, microscopy versus the in situ uh, imaging to see uh, the tissue to tell what may be the uh, cancer or not? Uh, well, I think as, uh, as the main problem, um, so we are now quite far in the lab with making a, uh, a rigid needle so that you can, uh, um, yeah, like, like a normal needle insert into uh, tissue, but for, but these, the, the, the lung endoscopists, they actually want, of course, uh, they wanted to fit in their, in their, uh, endoscope. Uh, so it has to be flexible, and that uh, that I find uh, would would still yeah form a challenge. I don't immediately see how we're going to solve that, but uh, usually we just start and see where we get. <laughs> yeah, but sure. yeah, but I mean, a few years ago we already demonstrated actually the the uh, the rigid needle, but then uh, we needed still too much laser power. But now with the uh, progress we have made with the ex vivo image an analysis for uh, image generation, so that we need only five milliwatts of laser power, this is well within the safe range of uh, to be used on, on humans. So now I think we can really move forward and, uh, and, and, and develop this and try and yeah, start testing this in, in, in practice. And uh, yeah, the next step will be to make it uh, a bit more uh, uh, small and flexible, uh, so it fits in this endoscope. But uh, yeah. okay, okay, cool. Yeah. So my my second question uh, to uh, Max. Um, so in, in the talk of your title, uh, your your section is a label free uh, image classification. I didn't actually uh, get a, a, to see the detail about uh, how when you train the network, what did you use for the, for the label? Um, I was a little bit uh, unclear on that. Can you please uh, explain more? Of course, of course. Uh, so the uh, images are labeled on image level. Uh, all the images we obtained from a sample from a patient, they are treated like a, a bag. So uh, if one patient is classified as any type of glioma, all the images we obtain, whether or not it might be accurate, all the images are considered glioma for that case. Okay. So you you have some uh, label there, um, but the imaging technology itself is label free. That was you are referring to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Okay. Yes. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, I see actually one question posted there um, by uh, Meng Yao Zhou. Um, the question is a very nice presentation. Right? Can you explain more about AI how to help with the imaging? Uh, Malus, do you want to take this? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. So um, I'm I'm very, very curious where the where the AI analysis uh, will bring us. Indeed, uh, I mean, Max showed, of course, this uh, nice work by what was it Google uh, on the uh, H&E uh, images that you can overlay the uh, um, 
AI analysis over the uh, freshly collected images. And it would be, of course, uh, great if we uh, can do something similar. On the other hand, I also think that 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 yeah, the more uh, yeah advanced analysis, eh, where where the where you train the uh, algorithm to look at more uh, subtle features, uh, uh, might also help uh, a pathologist in diagnosing, uh, making a, a correct diagnosis. And the other thing, of course, is that with these images, we enable uh, instant pathology. Um, and, and we need actually this automated diagnosis. That was the idea, because you don't always have a pathologist in the endoscopy suite. And uh, so it so this this al these algorithms should uh, uh, yeah partly replace or help uh, the pathologist uh, who is usually not present in an endoscopy suite because they just sent the tissue away to the pathology department. Okay, thanks. Maybe, maybe actually for Ming Zhou, because Ming Zhou is actually working on the development of this needle. Uh, uh, one, yeah, negative drawback for for the needle is, of course, it will always have a limited field of view, and maybe the probably the image quality will not be as high as of the images that I just showed you. And then uh, actually, a uh, an AI algorithm could help in, um, yeah, enhancing uh, the contrast in these images. Of a needle. Okay, wonderful. Um, there are another question of um, uh, Ryan uh, Meyer. So yeah, first actually very interesting talk. Thank you. Then actually the question is: Have you explored the uh, GAN-based neural nets to convert these uh, HHG images into HNE like contrast? Ah. Yeah, no, that, that I have seen, uh, of course, uh, colleagues in the world do that, uh, uh, but um, uh, the, the color, actually the color range of an HD image is limited, right? It's uh, pink and purple. And uh, we have, first of all, three different signals uh, and, and which we yeah, give arbitrary this green, red and blue uh, coloring which generates a lot of uh, contrast. And um, in my experience, whoever, whichever clinicians you, you, you ask to look at these images, either pathologist or a pulmonologist or a neurosurgeon, they recognize uh, what they need to see in these images. So from, from them, I never get the question, can you not color this in, in pink? So, yeah. Okay, I see Marlene uh, raising her uh, hand. Yes. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Marloes. I'm always amazed about uh, these images and the kind of detail that they show. Uh, I, I was wondering, where do you see this technique go in the future? Um, do you want to replace uh, classical histology or, or should they work together? Mm, actually, I, I think... Um... Uh, of course, uh, classical histology is now the golden standard, but e but if you go into the pathology lab and uh, yeah, you know of course that now also the the uh, genetic makeup of a tumor is also very important to choose the right uh, treatment. So what I think uh, would be good uh, is that indeed this technique also in the pathology uh, laboratory replaces the histology. Uh, which actually destroys the tissue. Eh? So, but now you you can make an image of the tissue with a similar quality uh, of information as the histology, but then use the tissue for a more advanced uh, uh, genetic uh, profiling of the makeup of the tumor. So, I think it should have a place both in the pathology laboratory as in the uh, endoscopy suite and in the operating room. Right. And could you talk a little bit more about uh, what are the main applications you'd like to target, or maybe the first application you'd like to target with the needle, uh, the in vivo uh, imaging? Yeah, uh, I'm always uh, of the low hanging fruit. So I first want to uh, indeed the, the 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 rigid needle that we develop. Uh, I want to uh, use that and demonstrate that. Uh, that is actually really suit, suited for brain surgeries 
uh, because it's it's a relatively blunt needle and that's what also the neurosurgeons want so it has a diameter of 1.4 millimeter so it would be great for that so that they can probe underlying uh, areas of the brain to see whether there's more tumor that they need to uh, remove and yeah there are also more yeah in the in the connective tissue diseases uh, and the applications there so um yeah so there are applications there and and there's a, a much wider range of endoscopic applications because that's what yeah, all these hollow organs, that's where people go now already with their video cameras and so on. And uh, yeah, for that, we need a bit more uh, technical developments. But... First, the low hanging fruits. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, I don't I don't see any I think that yeah maybe we can uh, conclude the session here uh, I'd like to thank the speakers again um, thank you Malus and Max um, fantastic talk thank you very much and uh, thank you everyone for attending our uh, seminar see you next thank time you very much. bye bye bye, bye.